Welcome to the Echo Ratings Eventing Podcast. And we have got listeners an International Women's Day special. And we have lined up a lady who I have to admit, I'm one of her biggest fans, so I'm going to put that out there right now. She is the only woman to have ridden competitively around both badminton and the Grand National Fence at Aintree. She's had a hugely successful career in broadcasting. She is super mum as well, four children. Welcome to the show, Alice Plunkett. Oh, you're always so nice. God, why do I speak (laughs) to you every day? Honestly, I wish I was all those things. I'm a grumpy old bag trying to homeschool unsuccessfully uh four children um and deal with a, an enormous racing crisis at the moment so um i'm probably not the best person to speak to on international women's no. day but uh, my god what a what a day to celebrate that is exactly why we want to talk to you um <laughs> homeschooling is a whole different topic of conversation but it is nearly over alice it is nearly done I fingers know, crossed Monday. i know tomorrow's oh. the last day can you believe it it's so exciting Not long to go. Um, Let's go back to kind of where your love of eventing and love of horses came from, because there's so many different sort of facets to your life and career that we'll come on to. But where did it all begin? It all started with me with my family, really. I'm blessed to have been brought up in a rural environment. My my grandpa was a sort of classic cavalryman in the war and played polo and fieldmaster the Heathrop and you know, ha- had the odd broodmare and bred pointer pointers and um, and the odd national hunt horse and and so I think for my mum it was very much in her in her upbringing and my dad was brought up in a farm in Cornwall and he had he rode in the Pony Club Championships and he rode in pointer points even though he was enormous <clears throat> and so and they both hunted and so it was just always that's what we did really I mean. Oh, not. Uh, they certainly weren't like William's parents in terms of the sort of success that William's mother, you know, experienced. And she was very much more professional. My my parents weren't professional at all. They just lived it, loved it. There was always horses about. And so for me, it was a passion that was just sort of always there. And it was never really meant to be a job. Um, I think, you know, all parents dread their horsey children saying, I'm going to do horses for my life. And they go, oh, God, no, don't do it. Um, but it just was an underlying passion and I feel very lucky and I really hope my children have a passion because it's such a guiding light in your life and it's such a focus that gives you direction and, and, and that's what it's, it's done for me really. And did you, so it sort of happened um, such, maybe not the plan of your parents, but when did you decide that actually going down that was what you wanted to do for a career? Because you, you, started you went to university first of all didn't you yeah I mean I I rode in the young rider European championships in my gap year and um I, I my my parents were always very adamant my, they were both quite academic and they both felt quite strongly that you know you, you if you're going to do horses that's fine but you need to f- finish your education and I feel and I'm very grateful to them for for doing that because I certainly thought I was sort of national and international velvet and that you know school wasn't much fun but um but actually you know doing um, my A-levels led to to me getting a place at Bristol University I could have gone to Oxford but they'd said you know no if you you do that you're gonna have to stop riding and I definitely wasn't prepared to do that and Bristol was great I had my event horses with Angela Tucker and Mike and Angela um were and, and Granny Tucker were were like family to me and um so I had a great time with that and then I worked in the mornings at a racing yard um Pat Murphy who was a flat and jumps trainer just down the road and um so to be honest I didn't spend a single weekend at university and <laughs> I um I used to run into lectures in my britches and chaps and um most of my housemates thought I was pretty you know I dipped in and dipped out but I got a 2-1 I, I you know I enjoyed the experience of learning getting to know Bristol and um yeah and the eventing and the racing sort of carried along beside it so when I left university I certainly wasn't thinking I was going to be a professional rider but I got a job to go and work for the racing post in Paris and um I was bilingual in French and I thought that that would be a cool thing to do and I'd take my horses with me and then tragedy struck and my dear sister Katie died and um, it was very clear that it wasn't appropriate for me to abandon England and go abroad so I I put I turned the job down and I stayed at home and 
sort of set up my own eventing yard to be close to mum and dad and my other sister Elle and um and to be you know be there for everybody and and that sort of then kind of kept on kept on evolving alongside the racing it was it was it was a kind of weird time of horses giving us all something to focus on when we you know everything was so difficult something to keep going a light oh, can I ask you about the racing because you were 19 when you rode in the fox hunters um over the national fences at Aintree what was that experience like because I mean one of the things that I wanted to ask you about on this show was very much um you know I guess the sort of the importance of, of International Women's Day as such and racing back then I imagine was extremely male dominated back in the early 90s in particular what was that like? Well there was some very strong leading lights actually in um in terms of women riding um for my 16th birthday my mum took me get, get gave me the opportunity to ride out for Roddy Armitage and Roddy um had two children Marcus who is now the racing correspondent for the Telegraph and and the horse and the hound, and he won the Grand National on Mr. Frisk in in 1990. And um, G, his sister, was a very good uh, jump jockey, and they made such an impression on me, the two of them, when I went there to ride out. And um, they became great mentors of mine. Um, and they, I, I just that first experience of racing when I went to the yard, I just, I mean, I had my Mr. Patey hat on. I looked like some little hunting girl <laughs> and I just loved the buzz of the yard. I loved the feel of the racehorses. I loved the chat and the, it, and the banter. And I just, it absolutely bit me that morning. And once I'd been there, I was determined to ride in point to points and uh, rode in point to point to my gap year. Um, I had a, a homebred horse that my grandpa, when he died, he'd left to my mum as a four-year-old and said, I can see this horse's white face landing over beaches or coming up the hill at Cheltenham. And, uh, but he'd, he'd injured himself in training and then come home and done his rehab. And it just timed right for him to start point to pointing or be available for me to point to point, lucky girl, um, in, in my gap here. And I had three rides on him. I, I was second, then I had a fall and then I was second. And then we came out the following season and he won the ladies open at the Beaufort point to point, which was just amazing. I thought that would be the pinnacle of my racing. And that made him qualified for the Fox Hunters um, that April. And my mum sort of had the words of her dad ringing in her ears about him landing over beaches and thought, well, let's have a crack. So it was completely bonkers. I mean, I'd had five point to point rides. I'd never, I'd never even ridden in a proper chase. And um, I was, like you said, I was 19. And I remember driving him up there with Sue Armitage, uh, Marcus's mum. And Marcus uh, walked the course with me. And he'd already won the national by that stage. So, you know, I felt very lucky. Never let me walk inside the wings. Um, Richard Pittman interviewed me and was sort of like, you know, who are you, silly little girl who's never ridden? But I sort of had a confidence because I'd done a European Championships. I'd hunted all my life with the Heathrow. I, you know, I had a huge amount of riding experience and I'd schooled and, ridden, you know, a lot of race horses. But I, I just hadn't ridden in very many races. But I had this extraordinary horse that I had a very good relationship with and he gave me the best spin ever. But it was quite funny. I finished and my dad came rushing out onto the course and I was thinking oh he's going to tell me how brilliant I am and he said if you gave the outside away to nobody if you got white paint on your right boot he said if you <laughs> even take and half a decent racing line we could have bought a new farm it turned out it had this enormous bet on me um it was <laughs> completely ridiculous <laughs> I was so cross that I'd given it the most appalling ride um but yeah I was you know I sort of almost can hardly remember it I feel very lucky to have had the chance to do it I then did get opportunity to ride again uh where the son had uh, later on had a, a guy who had this cumulative bet that um Manchester United would win the treble and with all these different things uh, Oxford would win the boat race and that a girl would win the grand national before the millennium before 2000 and they had 40,000 to lease a horse and they wanted me to ride it and uh, we went around the country trying to find this horse and unfortunately we never we never managed to find one. So I'd never got to ride in the Grand National itself, which would have been fantastic. But, you know, Aintree is such a magical place. And to even have had a tiny taste um, of actually doing what I did was, was is just so such a gift. It's so lucky. And, and honestly, it was balmy, really. 
Um, and to think that that chance never came up again, you know, it just shows how, what a, you know what a miracle it is. But the thing to learn from it is when opportunity comes, opportunity comes along, grab it because you know you never know what's going to happen next. And I never got you know I never got that chance again. No, and it's a very good point because actually the the odds were stacked against if you think only five rides and then going to the fox hunters and then actually having the opportunity later with all with the 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 backing to do so in the national and they're actually not being able to come off. Um, yeah. How did that compare to your eventing? Because obviously Fox Hunters in 93, but you went all the way up to top level eventing as well. You completed badminton, clear round cross country. What was that experience like? Um, I think, look, I was, I was a very middle of the road uh, rider. Um, I, I had, uh, great conviction I was pretty brave but I wasn't you know I wasn't very good um I I I certainly you know now and I spent 20 years supporting William I realized how bad I was probably but um I I was pretty determined and I think the thing probably if I do give myself some credit was I was very good at working to my strengths and covering up my weaknesses you know I'm not a very organized person I'm not a very structured person um but I, I managed to get a very good sponsor, and I worked really hard to do that, Racing Green. And they were great, and they uh, gave me a really good sum of money. And what I decided to do was compress my team to sort of three or four really good horses, um, put them at livery with Simon Lawrence, who mentored me and helped me hugely, and, and start working. So I sort of decided that I'd be better to pay somebody, um, you know, £10 an hour and earn £15 an hour. Um, and and be helped with the structure and the organization of, of, of getting there. And that was a big game changer for me because that then gave me real professional backing, proper training and um, proper, you know, support with the management of the horses. And I think that that was the difference. And, you know, you, you spend a long time trying to get horses qualified and good enough. And um, so again, you know, a bit like entry, it's an amazing opportunity to, to have had the chance. And when I rode Brown Babington, I realised very quickly that I either spent the next 10 years trying to finish in the top three or accept that that was a really fantastic achievement and um, and probably time to, to look at other things. I was 27 and I sold the horses and paid my mortgage, which was, which was incredible, to come out of the sport with some money and, you know, feeling very satisfied with what I'd done. I think it's very easy in our sport to just keep on going because it's sort of almost harder and scarier to stop than it is to carry on. But, um, you know, there is a great life out there away from it. <laughs> and uh, it, But it's not always easy to, to step away from something that gets under your skin so much. Yeah, absolutely. Did you, had you already sort of dipped your toe into broadcasting at this stage? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had this funny thing where I was riding at Blenheim on a very good horse and they, a TV crew um, were doing a series called Reach for the Stars. And it was on young people doing out of the ordinary things. So they did a musician and a gymnast and all sorts. And um, they contacted um, British Eventing and said, we'd like to follow a young rider. And they suggested me. So they came with me to Blenheim. And it was perfect. You'll get this. Because I led the dressage, which no one expected, and then fell in the water. So it was really good telling. <laughs> perfect TV. Perfect TV, you know, so highs and lows and lots of crying and all that. And um, but the guy who produced it was John Peel's brother, and um, John Peel, the Radio One DJ, and he was really nice. He said, "Look, you come across all right. If you wanted to do more of this, I would certainly encourage you." So uh, the next year, I worked at Blenheim for Fox FM, which was the local radio, and then did the, uh, the same at the Cheltenham Festival for the local radio. Um, and then got on well with that guy. He gave me my own show. And, you know, I mean, in the same way as you have done so brilliantly, if you sort of make yourself available and you're helpful and you, you know, you, you fit in and you just do what anybody wants, things just started to happen. And then I ended up with a, at Ascot and the Derby and suddenly I was having a screen test for Sky. And, you know, it's just so funny how things work. Um, but all the time I was still riding and I remember Claire Balding saying to me, what are you doing? You know, you could you could do this full time, but I just hadn't finished the riding. You know, there was still there was still that unfinished business. Um, and um, when that when it once I'd done badminton, I went to Punchestown the next year. Had a great spin around there. Won uh, won a three star at somewhere, and I thought, you know what, I've won a three day. I've had a great spin around badminton, 
and uh, I think it's time. I think I felt brave enough then to just to move on to um, you know taking doing the broadcasting full time, making the jump into that, and, yeah, and it's been the jump. massively successful for you. If you look back, it's hard to say pick a highlight because there's been many. But is there anything that that stands out to you that you're most proud of? Yeah, I think I took a big punt when I stopped riding. Um, I. I was set up a feature to do a feature on flying with horses and I um, had organised to fly with the Derby horse down to Hong Kong to, for the Hong Kong Internationals, which is a big race meeting in December. And, um, and, and, the, and it fell through, but I'd been dealing with the Hong Kong Jockey Club and they said to me, come on out anyway, you know, we'll get on with you well, we'll find you a job for the, for the race meeting. And I went out there and I worked as a runner and whizzed about and I absolutely loved it. It was the most incredible experience and I suddenly opened my eyes to the rest of the world. And I went back again um, the following year and met up with some people who were doing a series on the $12 million races around the world. And I thought, I want a bit of that. (laughs) And I flew myself to Canada, which was the first leg. I took a punt. And and I was in the hotel where they were all staying and they were like, oh my gosh, hi. Hi. How are you? Do you? Gosh, do you want to do you want a guest on the show? And I was like, oh, um, let me just, I'll just see if I've got time. I don't, I'll get back to you on that. Uh, <laughs> ended up guesting on the first leg of the series, and then um, they asked me to join them for the whole series. So um, I think that's the thing I'm proud of, proudest of. I took a punt. I knew that there was an opportunity there that I really wanted to be involved with, and um, ended up travelling the world doing. Um, programs from Canada, Dubai, Hong Kong, um, America, Germany, Ireland, France, Australia. And so that first year after I stopped riding, I had this amazing time traveling and with racing. And it certainly put the horse thing to bed for me (laughs) and really catapulted me into the next phase. And through that, I started to do features. I went down from Hong Kong. I went down to New Zealand and I did a film on Mark Todd. Uh, he just retired after the Sydney Olympics and I filmed him at his new place and rode Charisma and had this amazing time. And I sold that feature, which paid for my trip. And, it, you know, those kind of things give you confidence and you start thinking, hang on, I could do this. And I met this great trainer, Tony Noonan, at the sales. And he said, oh, I've got a horse running at Ascot. So I interviewed him and I sent it to Andrew Franklin, who I knew was the head of Channel 4 Racing. And he was so grateful. He asked, you know, to come for an interview. And then that suddenly leads to you to me getting a spot on on Channel 4 Racing. Um, and, and that was a dream, you know, John Frankham, John McCrurick. Um, and who was I? I was just some silly little horsey girl that liked chatting about about racing. But suddenly I sort of managed to get myself into the dream team. And it still seems ridiculous. I don't really know how quite I've wiggled my way into all these places. Um, but, but God, it's been a good laugh. Hard work, talent, and a huge amount of initiative. There you go. Um, I'm not sure about that. Absolutely, I think a absolutely. lot of luck. And you know, we're talking about World Women's Day, but I, I think I, I was a woman at the right time, if that makes sense. Um, okay. I think it was a time where where people really felt that you know teams needed to be more balanced. Um, Claire Balding and Leslie Graham had very much sort of been the the forerunners and they were very much looking for women so they were way better broadcasters than me out there but they wanted they definitely wanted a woman about so that was that I was lucky on that front uh, how have you juggled it because obviously William's career has been I mean we've we've documented it on the, the podcast if you want to go back listeners there was a show that we did with him last summer um that kind of looks at some of his highlights in the in his career but it, it's been an extraordinary career so he's obviously um been massively successful you've got four children how do you juggle it is there a secret or is I think it my just... poor children would probably say I don't juggle it very well um <laughs> I have a really amazing um husband who lets me go to work um which is brilliant um and I have an incredible housekeeper called Emma who is just so wonderful I have amazing children who you know who are full of um independence and initiative I think and they're little buggers as well but um (laughs) you know they this has always been the way it has been you know my season runs from um October till April and Will season runs from March till October um and 
I thought, I've thought so many times it's time to stop, but I think um, I would. I, I, it's a, I get a huge amount of energy from going to work. I know we've you and I have talked about this, and mm. you know, coming back into home life I always, you know, it's just great. It sort of makes me wash my hair and brush my teeth and shave my legs and make an effort, and it gets you out of home and it get, keeps your brain going. And sometimes I've thought, what am I doing? And there's been plenty of times. Uh, when I've come back from having babies where I've not been in a very good mental state. And one year, year I was stood down for six months because I was really not in a place where I was up to to, to going to work. I hadn't got my home work-life balance right and I hadn't got the support right at home to be confident enough to do it. So, you know, it's not all been plain sailing. There's certainly been some wobbly times um, and times where I thought, what am I doing? And I think when the ITV gig came up, I thought there's no way I'll be part of that. You know, I'm 40, I'm 48 now, so I was probably 45 when that, that came about. And I went for the interview and I said to them, you know, I'm a mum and I'm a wife and I have a job and I really love what I do. But it was the first time I had the confidence to say, look, this is, this is my order. If my babies are poorly, I can't come to work. And if my husband's got something really important, I have to support him. But but I love what I do, and I love racing, and I like telling the stories, and I like hearing what people have got to say, and I'd love to be part of your setup. And amazingly, they said they gave me the job, and um, so to be have been part of this new setup. Well, it's not set new now; we're in our fourth year, um, but we've won a we've won two Baftas, and uh, you know it's been an amazing, um, amazingly successful team to be part of, which has been. Uh, another whole you know journey which is in broadcasting at 45 is pretty nice to to get involved in that and and it's a very different role for me I used to front the Charlton Festival with Channel 4 with alongside Alistair I would take a very different role now but I love watching Ed and Cheska and I love supporting them and uh, it's just so much fun. Do you think it's important to you as well that actually you said you wanted your kids to find something that they're passionate about when they're older, that actually they see you being able to sort of set that example now? I don't know. I mean, I think like all mums, I feel huge guilt all the time, but I think every working mum does. Um, But I, where I used to do all the racing, now I just do jump racing. So I don't work from... April till October and so for the summer holidays I'm here all the time uh, doing Pony Club camp and all of that kind of stuff um, obviously you and I had great fun with ERM but I stepped back from that because I it pushed the balance into the wrong you know the wrong way and so you just got to constantly keep reviewing keep looking at it keep thinking can I really do that should I be doing that um, it's important to help the staff here and be present for everybody here so it's a, it's a juggling act, but I think, you know, you've just got to keep looking at it, keep saying, I was a director at Cheltenham, which I loved, but I did three years and I thought, you know, that's not, that actually I need to, that's time that's not best spent. I should be with my kids or I should be, that's not, that's not quite right, even though I loved it from a professional point of view, from a personal point of view, it wasn't quite the right time to be doing it. So I think you got to not say no, but you've got to keep keep reviewing and changing and thinking about you know what you can and can't do because annoyingly you can't do everything can you no you can't but you've got to find what works for you what works for family work-wise all of those things come together um what about the future obviously your your family is hugely important is there anything personally from a career perspective or that you would still really love to say I'd like to take that off no I don't think there is you know I I feel very satisfied. I've, I'm not, funny enough, I'm not ambitious. I don't, I don't want to be the, the next Claire Balding. I don't, uh, I, I, what I love is being part of a team. I really love being part of a team. I love turning up on a Friday and sitting in the production meetings and listening to everybody. I have such respect for everyone in our team. And I love our team here at home. You know, we have an amazing team here of such... Um, dynamic people who are passionate about Will and passionate about the horses. So, so um, you know, it's I like being around a lot of people who, who want to do things well, and I'm so lucky because I've got that. Teamwork makes the dream work. Alice, Teamwork it is... makes the dream work. Yeah. yeah it... I mean, it kind of silly, isn't it? But I can't really think of stuff that, you know, if I could, I've just signed a new three-year deal with ITV, 
so that'll take me till I'm 50. It's it that seems you know that seems like a an interesting time to keep reviewing. My oldest is 15 now. Um, so by the time I've finished this contract, he'll have left school, which seems extraordinary. Um, but but the girls are little still, and William's still you know hungry for more with the horses. So who knows? Who knows? Who knows, I mean, who knows what the future will bring? I know. It's um, good fun, isn't it? Aren't we lucky? Who knows? That's half the fun. That's half the excitement, not knowing what's around the corner and what could be in store. But Alice, thank you so much. It's been an incredible career and you're very, very modest because you have worked exceptionally hard. You're exceptionally talented and exceptionally generous as well with your with your time and with your knowledge and everything else as well. So we really do appreciate coming on the show to help us celebrate International Women's Day oh, in 2021. Well done you. I mean, you're the future star. So um keep it all up and um yeah we should be celebrating you on world women's day the struggling <laughs> efficient one that manages to corral me into getting on the air so thank you so much for oh. your patience with my shambles i will just clip that little bit and keep it for myself personally <laughs> um alice thank you so much it has been a pleasure listeners we hope you've enjoyed a very special episode of the echo ratings eventing podcast we've got more in store for you throughout march and we have plenty more coming your way don't forget that it for every comment share or review of the show you could be in chance with winning the listener of the month and that is an equilium casual light mask worth nearly 700 euros so get engaging but for now that is all we've got time for a big thank you to alice and a big thank you to you for listening